see if they have the tornado drill. We've been told there's a tornado siren supposed to come on at 10, and it did not happen. So, okay, we're going to go. So, yeah, as soon as, we, as soon as we start talking, good morning. Welcome to the bucket courses. Everything you want to know before you kick the bucket. We're glad to see you all here. I know you're going to be glad you came this morning. My name's Barb, Barb Lees, and here are some things you need to know before we start. Please silence your cell phones. Turn on your T-coil if you have one. If there's a discussion or time for questions, we'll come around with the microphones. Please speak directly into the microphones. And if you're able, after the program, uh, you could help put your chair up. There's a dolly at the front and a dolly at the back. Just for your information, um, if there is ever a tornado drill while we're here, uh, or a real, I should say if there's a real tornado while we're here, this, there is a basement in this building, and the stairs to the basement are go to the lobby, go straight east all the way through the lobby to the windows, Look to your right, and there's a door there that says stairs. That's where the basement, that's how you get to the basement. Okay. All right, now for the main event. Professor Josh Sandquist is chair of the Grinnell College Biology Department and of the General Science Department. Today in his bucket course entitled The Art of Baby Making, he will share scientific information about human reproduction and embryonic development, including assisted reproductive technology. He encourages thoughtful and open dialogue as an essential element in developing a shared understanding of what it means to make babies. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Josh Sanquist. Thank you. Uh, I just want to make sure everyone can hear me in the back. We're good? Okay, thanks for those thumbs up. Um, I'm really glad to be here. As you just heard, my name is Josh Sandquist. Uh, I gave a lecture here a few years ago on pharmacology, so maybe a few of you remember that. I teach at the college. I teach in the biology department, mostly uh, in the cell biology area, but I do have, a, I have some pharmacology in my training. Uh, this subject is not something that I was necessarily received training in, but I, I developed an introductory biology course 12 years ago now that uh, focused on um, vertebrate development. So if you don't know what that means, that's okay. We'll get into that a little bit. But it's basi basically in the course, we fertilize frog eggs and then study how they develop into tadpoles, and we ask questions about that. And as, I st as we studied that and I learned more about how organisms develop, I just became really fascinated by the process and sort of the wild history that is the study of you know, reproduction. So I dug more and more into it, uh, read more about these things, and I ended up developing a freshman tutorial course uh, of the same name, The Art of Baby Making. And it's a great topic to study some biology, but also how the biological science, I think, interfaces with society. This is something that most people think about and impacts their daily lives, you know, having families, reproducing. So I like this subject a lot, um, and I hope um, you find it interesting. I was originally thinking of this as like at least maybe a two-core series, but th scheduling things changed. I'm down to one, and so I, I hope I can get all my ideas. I, I didn't cram too much <laughs> in uh, to one lecture. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I did mention, oh, so here's a little bit of a review of what was just read. Um, I listed, I brought a couple books. Last time I was asked to suggest a couple books, so I have some book titles. If anyone's interested in reading more on these things, Fear, Wonder, and Science is this really excellent text that's a blend of the, b the hard science of reproduction mixed with like the societal impact. And Pandora's Baby is a really fascinating history of how in vitro fertilization um, came to be. So uh, those, those are texts I would recommend if you wanted to read more about this. So I'm going to start with what I call uh, the problem of heredity. 
Uh, this is a picture of me with my, our son Isaac, who's almost 15 now, and you can see we have some features in common. We look pretty similar. So it's been known for as long as people have thought about these things that offspring generally resemble their parents. Um, and while the mechanisms, the methods of reproduction were clear, the, uh, the details behind how this worked, how do offspring look like their parents, that was not understood. So what is the physical basis? How does this work biologically that this information can be passed down from parents to offspring? That's the question. And so, um, as I said, people have been thinking about this for a long time. It may or may not surprise you to know that this is something that concerned Aristotle, a great Greek thinker on many topics. Um, he thought about the problem of heredity a lot, and he made some really important observations that were, are still you know, known to be accurate today. He uh, observed the way the animals are born. So oviparous, some animals are born with eggs, like uh, birds and uh, fish and things like that. There's a very obvious egg that happens outside of the body. Some are what we say are viviparous, like us humans. Everything happens inside, and there's no obvious egg that you could see externally. It's not laid outside. Uh, he, Aristotle correctly uh, thought about the functions of the placenta, the umbilical cord. He noticed different ways that these things divided, different patterns of development. So these are a lot of things that scientifically are still accurate, his observations. He also had some other interesting uh, ideas that they couldn't have really had scientific knowledge of at the time. So for example, uh, Aristotle thought that the, um, the menstrual fluid when a woman becomes pregnant, she stops menstruating, and so where did that fluid go? They thought, well, the fluid must be the physical raw material that helps form the baby, right? That makes a lot of logical sense. We know that's not true. And that the semen was brought sort of like, um, like an animating force, engendered, imbued sort of the soul, the spirit into the growing um, embryo. And he had ideas like, I don't know how they came up with these numbers, but I thought that men were in sold at 40 days after fertilization and women were 90 days after fertilization. Don't know exactly how those numbers were come up with. So while we had a lot of accurate scientific thinking, there's a lot of, you know, sort of mystical thinking that also had to go on because they didn't have information to explain everything at the time. So the way Aristotle figured out some of his work was just to observe and think. Uh, he did a lot of work with the chicken egg, easy, abundant to get. And he would take and scratch little holes in the shells, making those little windows that he could see through and try to observe what's happening over time. Or he would crack open the egg at different days after it was laid and see what things looked like. And he came to, one of the conclusions he came to is that organisms start as sort of an unformed raw material that gradually develops over time, gains more structure, more complexity. This happened in stages. This is what we call epigenesis, the idea that you go from some raw material that f gains structure over time. Now, um, this idea was Aristotle's views dominated thinking for uh, millennia. Uh, there were other ideas about how this worked. In particular, some held with this idea called preformation. The idea that really the sperm carries just a super, super, super tiny person that then just needs to grow up into a bigger person. And evidently, this was easier to think about how, that, how it could happen, right? Just that it starts really small and grows big rather than taking all this raw material to assemble something as complex as a person. And uh, an animating force behind this happened in the 1600s, the late 1600s, as we just started to develop better and better microscopes. So um, cells and things are really too, most cells are too small to see by the naked eye. Uh, there was a scientist, uh, Nicholas Hartsoker, in the uh, late 1600s. He was a physicist and mathematician. He developed one form of uh, microscope. He was a colleague and trained and learned optics from another uh, Dutch researcher named Antoine von Leeuwenhoek, who is credited with developing really the first uh, really good microscope and seeing single-celled organisms for the first time. So he developed this little majigger here. There's a really tiny lens in that hole. 
that he was really good at grinding, and he made it super round, which had a very strong curvature, which allowed for the, the great magnification that he was able to get. I'm, I won't go into the physics of that too much. But he did things like he put, had a little glass tube that he would set on this little spine in front of the lens and look at pond water, and he saw these single-celled organisms. And some people think that um, there were other microscopes at the time. People, they weren't as good. People were mostly using them to just make things that they could already see that were really small, just make them a little bit bigger. And some people think that the genius of Leeuwenhoek was more than just his skill at grinding lenses, but his idea that there was something smaller than we can see that was worth seeing. And so he took the time to develop these, these microscopes, and he worked with Hart Soaker, and you know, they were interested in this idea of reproduction like so many people. So of course, they gathered a sample of semen and looked at that. And that's where they first, uh, so they are credited with making the first observations of sperm. That sperm had these single, were these single cells. And Hart Soaker said that he could see in one sperm, he saw a little person. I don't know if you can see, this is his drawing. He could see a little person in there. So this observation, this description, probably fit with some ideas he already had about how things worked. You know, sometimes we see what we want to see. But this, this description m kind of went a long way to support this idea of preformation, that um, the earliest stages in development were literally just miniature versions of the complete organisms that just needed space and time to grow. So um, this was around late 1600s. Uh, here's another drawing of the er two-day chick embryo. This is by someone, Marcello Malpighi, did a lot of interesting work in the late 1600s studying physiology. He cracked open a chicken egg, and this is a drawing he made. And so his point, his takeaway from this is that he agreed with Aristotle, that this is something that is developing over time. This is material that's forming out of the raw material. But other people looked at this and said, well, maybe you just don't have the right magnification. There's something smaller there. You know, there's still, I could still see a small person in there or a small chicken. So again, people kind of saw what they wanted to see in some of these early images, despite the fact that these were really you know, groundbreaking developments in terms of what we knew and what we understood about how this worked. So. Um, so even though the sperm was observed in the late 1600s and we knew some things like eggs, chicken eggs, were just very obvious and easy to see, it was not obvious that every organism had both sperm and egg. So as I said, humans and dogs and mammals, all that stuff happens internally. So there's no opportunity to observe an egg. And so there was this question, does, is this the sperm and egg combo universal to all organisms? So you have the chicken egg, very easy to see. Frog eggs are much smaller in scale, but you could still see them. They're like a little BB, you know, a, a little over a millimeter in size. Uh, the human egg is much smaller than the, chicken e the frog egg and the chicken egg. The human egg is still a pretty big cell compared to most cells in your body. It would probably be about the size of a period on, um, like if you typed out a piece of paper with just a normal size font, that's about how big this, the cell would be. That's still, that's pretty small. So um, people were, were arguing over this, you know, do humans, do mammals have eggs? And ev there's this story uh, in 1827, a German scientist named von Baer was arguing with a friend about whether or not, you know, mammals have eggs. And as luck would have it, the family pet was in heat at that moment. So they sacrificed the dog cut her open, looked, and they found evidence of an egg. So this is just one example of some of the, as I said, the interesting history <laughs> that happened and how do we study reproduction, you know? So there was, but after that, and by the late 1840s, more people observed and did thinking on this, and they came to generally understand that, you know, the idea of egg and sperm was a universal feature of reproduction that the sperm brought something from the man, the egg brought something from the women. These two things came together, and then you start getting the division processes that make the new, the new organism, the new offspring. So um, that idea took hold. Uh, here's a picture of a human egg with all the sperm. But it was still confusing to people oh, to think how 
you know, how this all works. What are all the details? That's, that makes sense on some level. You have part from mom, part from dad, they combine. But there's still a lot that's not known or understood about that, right? Well, what we know now, I'll catch us up a little bit, and I'll, then I'll complexify this a little bit more. So we know that uh, the sperm carries what I'm going to say is half the DNA of a normal cell now, of a normal cell. And the female egg carries half the DNA. So what do I mean by half the DNA? Uh, humans, it's different for different organisms, but humans have uh, their DNA, all the DNA in their cells are spread out over 46 chromosomes. So these are threads of DNA. Um, and there's 26 pairs of these chromosomes, or 23 pairs of these chromosomes. So they're just named, you know, one through two, except for what we call the sex chromosomes, X and Y. And so one copy of each of these comes from dad, and one copy of each of these comes from mom. So you have an egg and a sperm have half the amount of normal DNA, and then when they come together, the new embryo now has a full copy of all the DNA they need. And so um, these are mostly pretty similar. They carry all the same information on them. Oops, sorry, I bumped the buttons here. Um, just maybe there's just very subtle differences between these, but otherwise they carry all the same genes, all the same general information. Um, you'll notice the X and Y are quite different. Um, I'll, we'll come back to this in a little bit. Uh, females have two copies of X. Males typically have one X and one Y, although there is some variation there. Sometimes things happen in biology. A person may end up with three X's and one Y or other situations. And so th there's kind of this spectrum of gender we'll sometimes get depending on how this all works out. But the most, you know, the most common scenario is either two X's or one X and one Y. So that's what I meant by half the DNA. So uh, somehow in reproduction, and a sperm will be made, so it has half the normal amount. Egg has half the normal amount. Sperm and egg will come together. The sperm deposits its nucleus, carrying that DNA into the egg. Then these two nuclei will come together and fuse. And now this, what we call a zygote, it's a single cell, it's a fertilized egg, now it has all the DNA that it needs to be an organism, half coming from mom, half coming from dad. No, each one is still a double, a double helix. Yep. Other questions? Like, I forgot to say, feel free to yeah, shout out questions at any time. That doesn't bother me at all. Are there any other questions? Okay, good. All right, so we get this zygote, this fertilized egg, has all the DNA it needs. Now we just need to make more cells. So for the next little while, that's the main thing that happens. The cell will duplicate the DNA, and then it'll divide in half, so we get two cells. Then that happens again, so you get four cells, you get eight cells, you get a sense of how this goes. Just duplicate the DNA and make more cells. But at some point, you go from just a ball of cells to a chicken, right? And that now starts to get a little bit more complicated. It's a little bit harder to envision exactly how that might happen. If these are just dividing and getting smaller and more numerous, they have to do more than just multiply. They have to take on different functions. Some of these have to become heart cells. Some of these have to become nerve cells. And then they have to move around and assemble into uh, you know, tissues. You need to, the heart has a certain shape to it. So there's, there's, that's what kind of fascinated me about development. How, where does this information come? How do these things know what to do and know what to become over time? Furthermore, it's not really that different. They start out kind of the same. One cell becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight. And in this case, you get a chicken. Over here, one becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight, and then it gets a frog. And you never get frogs having chicken babies, right? So. Somehow, there's some more information there. It's more than just cells dividing and multiplying. They carry some other sort of information, right? It gets even more complicated. Well, you say, well, a chicken egg looks pretty different than a frog egg, so maybe there's some extra information there. But now if you think about dogs and all the range of dogs, you know, there's not 
that much difference in what a, these different frog, dogs, eggs, and sperm look like. But, you know, a Labrador never has a boxer for a baby, right? So there's some information there that makes this work accurately reproduce every time, right? Where's all the same thing for people? Ver, very much the same, but a lot of differences. So this goes back to partly, we're going to, a lot of this comes back to you know the DNA that carries a lot more information that that tells these cells how to organize and how to become a chicken or a frog or a poodle. Okay. But and so once we learn the power of DNA and we start to understand how much information is in there, we wasn't really clear how this information was coded, but we thought, well, okay, this stuff contains all that information, all the instructions we need to make an organism. And people started to th really become impressed with DNA, which is good. There's a lot of impressive you know, inf uh, details about DNA. But I think on some level now, and this is going to set up some ideas we're going to talk about a little bit later, I want to guard us against you know, putting um, too much stock behind DNA. And this is an idea. This is what I talk about in some of my classes. This, this problem of what we call genetic determinism. The idea that an individual's behavior is directly and exclusively determined by their genes. And I think this comes about, you know, we'll see commercials like this, adventure, it's in our DNA, UVA is in our DNA, DVDs are in our DNA. We don't know exactly what this, but you get the idea of what they're, tr the vibe they're trying to present with this, right? That something about us, inherent to us, our culture, DVDs are in our DNA. And there's been an increase, I don't know if any of you are interested in genealogy, but there's been a huge explosion of interest in this. People are packaging up their spit and sending it off to companies to measure, you know, what percent Irish am I? And so there's all this interest in DNA and the power of DNA. But I think you combine all of this, and it does explain a lot, but you combine all of this with a little bit of a lack of understanding of the biology, and people start to put a little bit too much stock in DNA. and becomes deterministic. If you have this gene, you will be this way. It becomes sort of fatalistic at times. People start to think, oh, I got this from mom or dad, and now I have to be this way. Or, or we start ascribing things like um, personality traits to different to, to color of skin. And it becomes really problematic if we get too deterministic about DNA. One example I can give you, um, there were studies that have been done. Um, if something that was formerly perceived as a lifestyle Let's say um, homosexuality was perceived as a lifestyle. And if you tell someone, well, there's a gene, there's a gene for homosexuality, then someone who formerly was really against that lifestyle now changes. Like, well, okay, it, it, you know, it, it was destiny, it was DNA, it was fatalistic. And so this really in affects the way people think about things rather than um, behaviors that are learned or... Um, and there's more than just behaviors, so I'm losing my train of thought here. But I w what I want us to, to get away from is this idea that DNA is too deterministic. And I'll explain right now some examples biologically of why this is the case. Um, so if we take what we call phenotype, there's this equation that I'm going to show you. Phenotype just basically means an organism's appearance, its traits, you know, all of its mannerisms, the way it acts, the way it thinks. What we say is that's actually its genotype, its DNA, its genetic material, plus environmental factors. The environment affects how people are and the way organisms act. It's not only the DNA is the point I'm trying to say. Um, DNA sort of sets the range of possibilities. This is why you don't have chicken DNA making a, f a frog, right? But there's still a lot of room for things um, to be altered. So here's a couple examples I'll give. The clownfish. Clownfish, interestingly, unlike humans, humans have, as I told you, those chromosomes, X and Y make men, X and X make women. Clownfish don't have that. They don't have DNA that makes different genders. They all have the same DNA, 
but they're swimming around in a school, a fish, and the largest clownfish becomes the female. All the rest are males. If the largest clownfish dies, the next largest one changes biologically to become female, even though they were bef before male, and now they become the egg layers. So the DNA is not different in that, but it changed its phenotype, right? So there was environmental factors that affected that. Has anyone heard or familiar with the free marten? That's a concept in agriculture. So this would be cases where if there were twin calves, one was male and one was female, they shared a womb together, uh, what happens is the hormones mix, so the hormones that were supposed to make the male calf mix and the female calf mix together in the womb, and the male loses fertility, becomes much less fertile. Females still look female, they have the female genitalia, but they're completely infertile. And again, that was all just by exposure to these hormones in their environment. And people, I mean, we all know identical twins are not the exact same people, right? Even though they, they have the exact same DNA, kind of very different personalities and appearances. And a really extreme example of this, um, so as I said, females have these two X chromosomes and men have an X and a Y. Well, there's this concept of um, what we call gene dosage, all right? So to be a, a healthy, a happy, healthy human, you only need, you know, one copy of all of these genes on the X. You don't need two copies of an X to be a human. So basically, a lot of these genes that are on this second X are not needed and in fact need to be inactivated, turned off, or, or the person will have too many of those genes. Okay, that's kind of a simplistic way of thinking about it, but that's exactly really how it works. And so there's some, so these genes, so you don't have two copies of unnecessary genes, some of these are turned off, but it's sort of random how these get turned off. And you can imagine, so there's a gene here, let's say, and there would be another copy of this gene here. We don't need both copies, but let's say one of these is mutated and would lead to the disease and one is normal. Well, depending on which one gets turned off and which one stays active, the girl will either have the disease or won't. And so you can have identical twins, one will have a disease and one won't, just by the randomness if one of them inactivated the normal copy or one of them inactivated the healthy copy. So I had some diagrams to show. All that is just to say that while DNA is powerful and amazing and carries all this information, it's not the only story. Okay? There's a lot of other factors that can affect how we develop and how we form and how we behave. I don't want to spend too much time on that, but I was setting that up to set up some other ideas we're going to talk about a little bit later in the lecture. All right, are we still with me? Any questions or anything right now? Okay. I hope I'm going at the right rate here. All right, so I want to come back to this, this idea of um, development. As I said, it's really fascinating. And here's a drawing showing you some different stages in a frog forming. So you have an egg and a sperm come together. They divide to make a couple cells. At some point though, it, as I said, there's more than just getting more cells. These things have to rearrange and start to form hearts and lungs and tails and eyes, and eventually you become a frog. Now a question I wanna pose to you is, when in this process did this frog's life begin? Right? You don't have to answer that, it's just rhetorical. We're gonna think about that, because there's different ways of thinking about this, okay? So some people will say, well, by just thinking about biologically, what are some ways, what are some points where you could defensively argue this organism's life began? Well, some people will say, well, these cells were never not alive. You know, the sperm is still a living, it's not an organism, but it's still a, a live cell, so maybe you'll say there was never a point where it was not alive, right? Well, then another argument is, as we talked about, when the sperm and egg come together, now they have all the DNA they need. Some people will say, well, now when the sperm and egg fertilize, now you have the DNA for a new, unique individual. So now that didn't exist before, now it does. And so this would be the time when you would say, this person came into being, because that's when their DNA first existed in the same cell. 
So that's a, that's a reasonable idea. But others will argue against that because up until about this point, what we call gastrulation, as I'll talk, I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but each of these cells has all the information it needs to make a full new organism. So if at this stage, one of these cells broke off and started dividing, you would end up having two people. That's how identical twins happen. At some point early in development, one of the cells or some of the cells break off and you get identical twins. So at fertilization, you may say, well, there's a unique new person made, but you don't know yet, is that gonna be one or two people? right? Or more. So you can't, well, that's not necessarily an individual person. We don't know. So it's hard to say that's the time that person began because that person may be two people. So some people argue it's actually gastrulation because after this point in development, that can no longer happen. So now we know this is going to be, you know, an individual organism. But this is still just a bunch of cells. There aren't really things that we associate with living organisms. Um, other arguments have been, well, maybe around this stage in development where you start forming organs, this is the basis be behind the fetal heartbeat bills. So when we detect a heartbeat, now it has an organ that's more like a, a living person. Um, the trouble with some of those is you can detect what we call heartbeat activity, but it doesn't really have the structure of a heart yet. It's just some of the cells that are acting that way. Other people argue um, the idea of when they become, when the organism f starts to uh, form brain activity. So this is sort of the inverse of the idea of brain dead. So for a long time, we've had people who have had brain damage, brain injury, they no longer really have neurological activity, but the rest of their body is still alive. And so there's a whole legal theory about, is that a person anymore? Because they no longer have the brain, what makes us human, the ability to think. And so if you flip that around, they wouldn't become a person until they have you know, evidence of brain activity. And that doesn't happen until maybe 25 or 26 weeks in human development, 23, 24. Other, and the basis for Roe v. Wade for a long time was this idea of viability, that the organism has to be able to live outside the womb. Before that point, it's not it's an individual because it's dependent completely on the mother, but after it's viable, after it can live on its own, uh, then it becomes a person. That's another argument. That would be around, there's no um, scientific definition of viability, but there are, we know rates of success. So if a baby's born around 20, three weeks, there's about a five to 6% chance that they'll live. At uh, 25 weeks, it becomes two thirds or three fourths. But even though they, the, the baby can live, there's still a lot of ad uh, health defects that happen when they're born that early. So I'm not saying one of these is better than the other. I'm just trying to get you to think about there's different ways that, that people have argued different times in this development based on the biology. But biology can really, you know, describe these events that are happening, but I don't think science is really good at saying, answering this sort of question. This is more of a philosophical question. And it's going to bring together a lot of different views, a lot of different ways people think about these things. A lot of different cultures over time have had a lot of different ways of thinking about this. If you think, if you frame this in the idea of if a, um, if a pregnant woman was killed, were you killing one or two people? Different cultures have answered that question different ways for a, a long time. English common law, they became a person at the quickening. So basically with the first time you felt the baby. Um, Catholic traditions have kind of changed a lot. For a long time they followed Aristotle's thinking on ensoulment, but different popes over time have changed the, uh, the rules at different times. So. I don't really want to get into these too much, but I just want to raise this, this question of, you know, how do we hold together these scientific facts that we know are true, you can describe, and also all these other beliefs, how do we hold these together to make rules that work for everyone in a pluralistic society? That's a pretty tough problem, right? But I think, like many things, there's a lot of, different people have different ideas, and while it's, 
really important to accept that other people have different ideas. We also need a shared set of facts to help us have an accurate conversation. And there's a lot of misinformation and people with agendas sharing different ideas about how this all works. So it becomes really hard to have these conversations is the point I'm trying to make. So that brings me to this next little mental exercise I want you to do. I want you to take a second. You, you can close your eyes if you want. You don't have to. But just form a mental image. When I say human embryo or fetus, you know, what's the mental image that comes to mind? So here are some pictures of different stages in development from the Carnegie um, <coughs> Museum. Um, I'm not going to ask anyone to share. I don't know very many people imagined you know, this <laughs> when they were imagining a human embryo or fetus. Maybe more something more like this. But I asked this question because I think it's really important. The, the ideas, the mental images we hold really shape our thinking on this subject. It's also important to note, if you look at this image here, if you look at the scale bar, five millimeters is about a fifth of an inch. So this whole thing here is about 1.2 inches, okay, in, inside, in real life. So it's blown up on this picture. It's a little, you don't really, it's hard to appreciate that. It looks kind of baby-like, but it's still very, very tiny, right? Now you take that image, those images, and you contrast it with something like this. This was the cover of Newsweek in 2003. Um, there's always been a lot of fights over when life begins, should a fetus have rights, these sort of things. And this, this, there was an article with this picture shown on the cover of the magazine. And some scientists were really upset about this because the way this image was used. The scale, there's no way of knowing the scale on the, on the, cover of a magazine that probably looks almost baby-sized, right? There's no umbilical cord. So it's kind of shown that like, you're detaching, you're separating the idea that this thing is still dependent on its mother, right? You're using the image to make it look baby-like and independent to help push maybe some agenda, some idea in the article. So this, this is a little bit about, you know, why I wanted to talk on this topic, to help people think have information, know how to think about these things, how to observe these things and think about these things. There was a pushback against this. I don't know if many of you saw this. Uh, I think it was maybe last year. There was some articles in the New York Times. These photos were published trying to push back against these sort of things. This was happening about the time where the fetal heartbeat bills were becoming really popular in the country, which would limit abortion after six weeks in development. Well, these are two images of human embryos at six weeks in development, right? So they were arguing, well, this, you know, this doesn't, the point of this article was, if you saw this, you wouldn't think little baby, right? So the images that you see are important to the story you're trying to tell. So where, where do I want to leave you with all this? Um, maybe this, I'll share this, and this will be a good point for our quick stop. Uh, just because it's a good stopping point. But, I mean, the idea, I guess I, guess I want to encourage us all to appreciate that this question is one that doesn't really have an obvious answer, you know, when life begins. That uh, in a society, sometimes we must accept that others have these different ideas, these different viewpoints. And the challenge, of course, is how we make rules that govern us all when there are so many different and contrasting views. And yet, like I said, while tolerance of different viewpoints is important, we do need these shared set of facts so we can have an open and honest conversation. And so I'm not pretending to have, you know, sort of the answer or anything on this. So I, I just hope that the information we've talked about so far this morning can help you uh, have a new understanding or maybe prompt new thinking on this topic. So that, that was one, this one major part of the lecture. We'll stop here for our break, if that's okay, and then we'll come back and we'll stop. We'll start talking about some more of the different technologies that relate to reproduction. Thank you. All right. Ten minute break. All right. Josh Sanquist. Okay. Let's make sure the uh, sound is good again. Put this back on. Thank you. All right. 
So hopefully now you've had a little to eat. You can uh, digest the rest of the lecture here. Um, so we're going to talk now about, we're going to shift gears a little and talk a little bit about some of the technology related to reproduction. So um, we haven't completely moved beyond, but we know a lot more than we, we used to know about you know, how reproduction works. And now we're using all that knowledge to kind of control things. And as I said in my description of the course, humans are unique in that you know, they have this ability to make so many decisions and plan and control so many aspects of um, having children. And these are maybe some things you've heard about, arf artificial insemination, in vitro fertilization, intracellular sperm injection. I'm not going to talk about that, but that's where they take the sperm and inject it straight into the egg if the sperm isn't able to get in on its own. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about mitochondrial donation in a few minutes. Uh, genetic diagnosis of embryos, you know, before they're even inside the womb. This allows things like disease screening, gender selection, trait selection. This is what some folks might call designer babies. We'll talk about this a little bit more. And even cloning. So these are some of the things that um, we can do now because we know more of how reproduction works. So a, a real quick primer, I'm going to spend the next little bit talking about in vitro fertilization because this was a real breakthrough in technology and this is sort of the platform that allows a lot of these other things to happen, to take place. So the way um, reproduction normally works, um, an ovary, so this is the uterus and the fallopian tube and the ovary where all the eggs are made. And over at the right time in, in, the, in the cycle, an egg will be released from the ovary. And this egg travels a little bit down the um, fallopian tube and it's actually fertilized just a little bit into the fallopian tube. It needs to happen here because as the fertilized egg continues to move through the fallopian tube, it does that dividing. It becomes two cells, becomes four cells, it becomes eight cells. And then some of the cells on the outside decide they want to be part of the um, placenta. And so you need all of that stuff to be made before it gets down to the uterus and then those external cells can join with cells from the uterus and form the, um, the placenta and the umbilical cord, and the cells on the inside compact, and those become the ones that will actually become the baby. So the fertilization happens way back here and takes time. Um, if you, you know, if this is why if sex doesn't happen at the right time, maybe the egg is too far along to get fertilized, it doesn't have enough time to develop to an implant, or if it's too early, the egg hasn't been released. So timing is an important part of this. So in vitro fertilization, we've basically taken most of this process and now do it outside. In vitro stands for in glass, so meaning you know, in a test tube. And so in vitro fertilization, the first step is to we want to collect a bunch of eggs. Normally only one is released at a time. So the first step in in vitro fertilization is to inject a woman with a bunch of hormones that cause her to release more eggs than normal. Um, yes, John. The question was how does the sperm get into the fallopian tube? So the sperm are motile. They have a little tail that allow them to flap. and So they actually... Um, they're probably deposited, you know, somewhere in here, and then they have to actually just swim along and get their way up to there. Um, there's, a, we'll talk about this a little bit more. There's actually something a maturation that happens to the sperm too. What's that? They're impatient. Well, um, maybe sort of. That's one thing. Um, I wasn't going to talk about too much, but just because there's only so many things we can talk about, there's all kinds of these ideas about, you know, the sperm, the kind of masculinize it, the sperm are competing and racing for the egg and the strongest one gets there. And there's these narratives that we've built that are sort of engendered into the process that aren't really, you know, scientifically accurate. That's not exactly how it's working. But these are ways you know, people come to talk about these things, right? That on some level are just, you know, no big deal. It's just the way people talk about it. But sometimes they can reinforce these ideas that can be problematic. So I wouldn't say it's not necessarily a race, but yeah, they do have to move and get there, right? Okay. Um, and so we inject the hormone. The woman ovulates 
produces a bunch of eggs. This can have some risk. Sometimes the hormones have um, some health risks if women react strongly to them. Um, we have to go in and then retrieve all these eggs from the fallopian tube. We bring those eggs and put them in a glass dish. Sperm um, can be collected a little bit more easily. It doesn't require surgery to get the sperm. Uh, so the males have the easier job here. But the sperm are um, you know, exposed to the egg in the dish. The fertilization happens. Then we let all those divisions happen. Two cells, four cells, eight cells. And then when it's about time where the egg would normally be getting to where it wants to form the placenta, you have to manually take these eggs and insert them back through um, the vaginal connect the uterus here, and insert them in, and then they'll implant into the uterus. So all of this stuff does happens in the test tube, but then it has to go back in. Um, some of the powers here, um, we can free we found that we can freeze these things. So you let them develop a certain point, you can pop them in the freezer, thaw them maybe you know a couple years later when you want to have child number two. So you do this once, and two or three years later you want to thaw them out and 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 put them back in. Um, other things we can do is, as I said, most of the cells at this point have the power to become a whole, they have all the information they need uh, to become a whole organism. Also, this thing can do without one. So what we can do is we can take one of these cells out and the rest develop perfectly fine to become a complete baby. But then we can look at the DNA in the one that we took out and decide, oh, this, this one here has this genetic disease we don't want. This one doesn't have the genetic. And then only put back into the uterus the ones that don't have the disease. So these, that's the pre-implantation genetic diagnosis that I talked about. The question was how long it takes for the embryo to thaw before they can put it in. I'm not exactly sure about that, but I imagine it's pretty quickly. They probably thaw it out. Um, I don't know a lot about the technology, but I, I imagine it's on the order of like, you know, a couple hours, more than days, that sort of time frame. We don't know some things like what's the limit here? Can we freeze them 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, and they still work? You know, these are things we don't know, but we do know that you can freeze them and thaw them and, and many of them still work. So that's sort of the backbone. Uh, so what are some people, what are some reasons people do IVF? Um, maybe there's a blockage in the ovary or the fallopian tube, so the eggs are released and they can't, and the sperm can't get to them. That's some forms of infertility. Um, maybe there's a low sperm count or low activity. They can't make their way up, th enough can't make their way up there. Um, some people choose to do this for different reasons, as we'll talk about, or maybe you know, just in life planning, get busy in a career and want to start later in life. So there's various reasons why people will choose IVF. Um, some of the concerns, this is all really expensive, the hormones and the surgeries. It could be ten, fifteen thousand dollars or more, depending on how many cycles you have to go, how many tries you have to go. Um, as I said, injecting the hormones can sometimes produce health risks for the mother. Um, then there's sort of a philosophical question that we'll come back to. But what do you do with the unused embryos? If we freeze these and then they decide they don't want them anymore because they got the babies they needed. And if you're someone who holds a view that this fertilized egg is a human, now you have basically frozen humans. And what do we do with those? So these are some of the concerns that people have about this process. So a little bit about the timeline and the history here um, of IVF. This, this is a sordid history. There's many scandalous story <laughs> tales I could share. I'm not going to share all of them. I'll just a few to give you the flavor of it. Um, so artificial insemination for, by donor, AID, first happened in 1884. William Pancoast at Philadelphia Medical College, Jefferson Medical College, was someone who was a fertility doctor of his time, trying to help people have babies. There was a couple who came in that could not have a, a child, and he was doing some work, and he decided that uh, the sperm was the problem. And so he brought the woman in, put her under chloroform, so she was asleep. 
and he found the most handsome looking medical student that he saw to provide some sperm and then use some rubber tubing to introduce those sperm into her uterus without her knowing and then lo and behold she had a baby so that was the first artificial insemination uh no sort of you know she she wasn't asked that's a problem you know like consent these things are problems the doctor felt guilty about this later and told the husband didn't tell her and the husband said well don't tell her that it's not ours um he was fine with it and then i don't know if later she ended up finding out but th- there's a lot of that sort of thing a lot of these experiments and work is done on women without their consent um and it's sort of this double-edged sword some of the things we know about we know about because of this work right but also it was very problematic that people weren't asked and people weren't given agency and so th- there's a lot of that sort of thing that happened through the history of in vitro fertilization yes Mm-hmm. So the question is did experiments of artificial insemination in cattle precede this? And I would say yes, a lot of this work had been worked out in livestock. So a lot of these things had been done in farming for a long time and then we asked can we do these in people too. And here's a picture of artificial insemination in a cow there's this long needle where he's trying to deposit the sperm way back in the uterus the other hand it goes in through the anus to try to hold things in place to so you can aim that needle but this sort of thing had been it done i don't know if exactly this technique but artificial insemination had been done in livestock for a long time because you recognize you know this bull has good qualities this cow has good qualities but they can't mate naturally so let's you know put our, get our hands dirty and so um yes So um in continuing that idea a Harvard professor performed some sort of IVF with rabbits early on really he mi- just mixed the sperm and egg together in the glass and put them right away back into the uterus so the fertilization probably actually happened inside the uterus so it's not really exactly in vitro fertilization but it hinted that this work could be done um other folks reported that they did you know, th- during this whole story there's a lot of people that said they did something and uh, most other people believe probably didn't <laughs> actually happen so in the 40s this couple said that they had done IVF in a human egg but no one really believes that that was the case the story really sort of takes place right starts here in the early 1960s this uh doctor researcher Robert Edwards is one of the pair that ended up doing the first successful in vitro fertilization so he was studying how development fertilization works in mice before this he was just generally interested in that biology but he switched over to doing this in humans because he wanted to see if he could take his knowledge and develop this and develop techniques that could help people have children um actually I, i'm realizing i have too many ideas here there's a, just a lot of shady characters this guy landrum shettles was um doing things like There was a woman who was scheduled for a hysterectomy so he asked her if he could try to fertilize an embryo and put it in your uterus just to see if it could work because you were going to take out the uterus anyway. So this sort of stuff is going on in the 60s. Um Robert Edwards who I talked about joined up with this other scientist and they worked out this problem of ca- sperm capacitation. So the sperm actually mature there's something that happens to them inside the uterus. that makes them mature and competent to fertilize the egg. So doing the in vitro work the sperm isn't active doesn't work so they had to figure that out and they had to figure out ways in the test tube to activate the sperm. So this was one of the important steps in in vitro fertilization um in the late 60s as I said you know part of the process here was getting those eggs out and then putting the embryos back in. That required kind of a big surgery it wasn't really efficient it was really hard on the patient um in the late 60s this other doctor patrick stepto stepto was developing this technique called laparoscopy which basically uses a really fine um mechanism where you can cut a really small hole and there's a camera and a light and you can do these surgeries with using very very small incisions and so 
uh, Edward saw this and thought, well, that's the technology I need to help me get eggs out and get uh, the fertilized embryos back inside the uterus. So Edwards and Steptoe joined forces in the late 60s. Um, now people are starting to hear about this and they're asking for funding. The Medical Research Council in Great Britain turned down Edwards and Steptoe's application for funds to continue this research because they were worried about the safety and probably some of the ethical concerns. Uh, the MRC said, well, if you get it to work in monkeys first, then maybe we'll give you money. And then Edwards' response was, well, monkeys aren't people. Like we need to do the work in people to figure out how it works in people. Um, other things, the Kennedy, Senator, the Kennedy Center was opened sometime before this, and they were doing a lot, the Kennedy Center for Performing Arts, but they had this conference. There's a, um, a Kennedy family member, a Shriver, that was born with a, um, a, f a handicap, and so the Kennedy family, through all their money and energy and political clout, behind some of these concerns of rights for people with handicaps. And so they, and there was this, documentary at the time on a Down syndrome baby that was basically allowed to starve to death. Uh, some s Down syndrome babies are born with um, blockages in their digestive tube that could be fixed with the surgery. Um, but there, were some p there was this kind of famous case of these parents at the time that decided they didn't want to do the surgery and they didn't want to have to care for a Down syndrome child because at that time in society there wasn't really the care available and the it was viewed differently, and so they basically just elected not to have the surgery. And so, as a part of this whole conference on these sort of things, who should, sur should survive, all these things, Edwards was at this conference, and he was on a panel called Fabricated Babies. Another person on the panel was James Watson, one of the co-discoverers of DNA, and they were asked, they were just, Edwards was defending IVF because IVF was wrapped up in all of this. In vitro fertilization was wrapped up in all of this, this scare, this nervousness. Um, about that same time, just before that conference I mentioned, Edwards and Steptoe had successfully fertilized embryos and grew them out to the point where you'd about get ready to put them back in. Um, and at this time, it was estimated that 20,000 babies a year were already being born by artificial insemination. So that technology was accepted, but people were still really, really concerned about in vitro fertilization at this time. Uh, the NIH, the fund main fund research funder in the United States at this time, said um, IVF could be funded if there were certain guidelines. I'm going to skip over this point. Um, Basically, there's, there's a bunch of conversations about whether or not we should do this, okay? And a lot of people were yes, some people were no, seems scary. Uh, there were people exaggerating things like there was claims that some millionaire was cloned on some random island and there was definitely not the technology to do that at the time. So all this was going on. And a part of this was the social context. In the 60s and 70s, we had feminism. Women were gaining independence. Um, Birth control was becoming a thing that more and more people had access to. In 72, the federal government basically said you can't block people's access to birth control. So there were concerns about the loss of the nuclear family. Uh, No-fault divorce laws contributed to that. Um, Roe v. Wade was in 1973, that decision was made. Um, in the 60s and 70s, coming out of environmentalism, people were a lot of people were worried about the human population was going to be too big and the earth wasn't going to be able to sustain that. And now you have this new technology for making new babies. Um, following the Vietnam War and um, pollution and the failures of the EPA and other government institutions to control pollution, there was a lot of distrust in government institutions and science. So all this was sort of wrapped up in the 60s and 70s at the same time that in vitro fertilization was being developed. So there was a lot of people who were very nervous. And then, 1978, Louise Brown was born in the UK. She came out, was a very happy, crying, pink little baby. Um, all of a sudden, overnight, everyone's fears about this change. Well, maybe IVF isn't so bad. You know, it can make a happy, cute little baby. 
The U.S. Federal Ethics Commission said the IVF was ethically acceptable right away, 1979, a year later. So here's Louise Brown on sh when she's 40. So this is celebrating the 40th anniversary of in vitro fertilization. Just your standard person, right? <laughs> I mean, IVF, IVF for, it's no different. Didn't create these monsters that people were worried about. So now, you fast forward a couple decades, the, hu the U.S. fertility market is estimated to be about $8 billion. There's a lot of people who want to use this to help them have children. Here are some quotes from one of those books that I mentioned. Um, we make things up, we try them on patients, and we never get informed consent because they just want us to make them pregnant. Offered a new experimental technique, women said, I will do anything to have my baby. So the point I'm making with these quotes is that there's a lot of desire seems sort of built into people to have a genetically related child. This is one whole lecture we talk about, you know, where does this come from? Um, sort of the taint of infertility. A lot of time, for a long time, women were thought of as really, you know, less than if they couldn't have babies. So there's all this desire that's built into us to have these babies, and we'll, some people who are struggling will say, I'll do anything to have a baby. And so this desire leads to places where you can charge $20,000 and we can try these techniques that haven't really been worked out. And so there was a lot of concern about the regulation of this. The United States, they basically said, well, the federal government's not going to get hit its hands dirty. We won't use any federal money to fund it. But beyond that, it wasn't really regulated. It wasn't really any thoughtful approach to all this. The UK had a different approach. Um, so uh, Baroness Mary Warnock was a philosopher and member of the UK House of Lords. They asked her to put together a committee to study this. They have a nationalized health service. They basically asked the question, is infertility a medical issue that the government should pay for? Right? Someone can't have a baby, they're not, it's not going to kill them. Is this a medical issue that health insurance should pay for? So she studied it, and she concluded, I won't go through all of her arguments, but she did conclude that infertility is a condition meriting treatment. And she recommended that the government set up a human fertilization and embryology authority to discuss, she saw these issues were going to continue, right? So it's like, let's make an agency with scientists and lay people that will discuss these things and have thoughtful discord about what we should pay for, what we should not. The United States has none of that. Um, in 2015, that agency approved something called mitochondrial donation. This is where, um, so a baby gets all of their mitochondria. The mitochondria are the organelles that create all the energy for a cell. They get all their mitochondria from the egg, none from the sperm. So if a mom has a, a mitochondrial disease, the baby is going to have mitochondrial disease. So there's a new technique where they said, well, let's take a fertilized egg Let's just take the nucleus with all the DNA that de defines that person out of mom's egg, and let's get the egg from another woman that has normal mitochondria. We'll take her nucleus out, put our baby's DNA in, and then we'll have a baby that's our baby, has all of our DNA, but it has this other woman's mitochondria so that they can be healthy. So this t technique in 2015 was that this council looked at it and said, that's fine, that's good. Let's go with it. Um, it took, I think, just last year. The it took eight years, though, for this to actually work. Um, so just last year, the first baby was born via this technique. Oh, boy. I packed way too much in here. Um, where should I end this? So we accepted that fertility, infertility is a problem worth treating. But there's a quote, again, from the same author of one of those books, technologies never exist in social vacuums. And if they cure old problems, they have the potential to make new ones, right? And the problem is we did not plan ahead. We did not foresee all the issues that this was going to raise. Uh, I had many funny stories, but maybe one I'll just share. Um, there was this wealthy couple in 1980s, um, late 1980s, who was using in vitro fertilization uh, to try to have a baby. They didn't have any children. They tried one cycle, it didn't work. They still had some frozen embryos in the freezer. 
The doctor said, we'll go on vacation, relax, de-stress, and we'll come back and we'll try again. Well, their plane crashed, they died. Um, frozen babies in the freezer, no heir to all the family fortune. All of a sudden, cousins come along and say, well, I'll take those frozen babies. You can put them in my uterus, and I'll have your child and collect all the money that comes along with those rights. So these were sort of things that the courts, no one was really prepared for these sort of things to happen when we were just doing the technology. And what we end up getting is we get a bunch of you know, random judges who have really no expertise in biology making all these decisions, and they had no preparation to think about how this all works. Um, just a month or two ago, the Alabama Supreme Court ruled that frozen embryos are people. They did not realize that this was going to actually stop in vitro fertilization. This was coming from a point of, well, we want to reinforce the idea that conception, fertilized egg, is a human. All right, this law supports that. They didn't realize this would stop IVF as we know it. IVF is very popular, and now a lot of lawmakers are trying to distance themselves from this. So I'm not trying to comment on the politics of it itself other than just the idea that these rule pe people don't have a full understanding or making these rules and we don't really have any we don't right have the right dialogue we need to think about all of these things. I'm not going to have time to talk about some of the other things that I wanted to mention. Um, one thing I was going to talk about I'll just kind of quickly share some of the ideas and I can stick around and answer questions if anyone has any thought. I was going to talk a little bit about cloning because I think this is a New Yorker cover from 2003, uh, seven years after Dolly the Lamb was cloned. Um, you can see the test tube there. You know, these are very much an allusion to the Madonna and child paintings where there's some sort of technology and then the, and the baby. You know, obviously the baby's face looks exactly like the mom's face. Um, so I think a lot of the fears about IVF were actually fears about cl cloning. Because cloning now is possible once we have IVF. You can take the way that this works. Let me just scan ahead here. This is how Dolly the lamb was cloned. Um, so they took the egg from a black-faced uh, donor and they took from a, a, a mom, a cell from the udder. So it wasn't an egg, just some other part, random part of the um, you. They took the nucleus out of this black face um, egg and they took the cell from the udder and injected that inside of this egg. So then the nucleus from this sheep ended up in the egg from that one. Then you take that, you run some electricity through it, activate it, it starts dividing, and plant this back into the black-faced sheep, and all the babies born are the non-black-faced type. So they're identical clones from the other sheep. Why were they interested in this? Well, this is the pharmaceutical industry and big bucks. Uh, we're making things like insulin inside, human insulin inside of these animals. You take the gene for the human gene for insulin and insert it into uh, a sheep. Hopefully the right cells will take up that DNA and it'll start making the insulin in its milk and then you can just get insulin from the milk. But that is a very low success rate. Some it doesn't work, some don't produce very much of the protein. Once in a while you'll get a sheep that's a super great producer. But if when that sheep dies, now you have to start all over again. and find. But now if we have cloning and we can just find that one sheep that has a good producer and clone other copies of it, now we don't have to worry about all that angst of making a new one. So this was a lot of the drive behind the cloning. Should we worry about human cloning was the question I was going to ask. I would say no is my short answer. I don't think it's really something that's going to warp society. Could it happen? Has it happened? Maybe, I don't know. It probably can happen if we can do it in other mammals. Um, but there's a lot of movies that say maybe we should worry about it. Jurassic Park is a form of cloning. Multiplicity is sort of this comedy where a guy makes copies of himself and copies of the copies, and the copies get dumber and dumber over time. So that's kind of funny. Here's one from the 70s. This is a really excellent movie. Uh, with Gregory Peck and Laurence Olivier and James Mason. This is a story about how the Nazis tried to clone a bunch of Hitlers and they wanted to bring back the Third Reich. 
So this is the sort of thing that I think people are thinking when they're thinking of cloning. And because IVF led to the possibility of cloning, a lot of people were scared about in vitro fertilization. But as I said, I don't, I don't think cloning is really the thing to, to scare us. Um, basically, I'll say it's because not many people are going to do it. As I said before, if you make a clone, they're not going to be the same person. If you took some of Hitler's skin and grew up in it, it's not going to be another Hitler because of all the things we talked about growing up. Decades later in a different environment, the womb, they're going to have different things they were exposed to when this, when this baby was developing. So we're not going to have, you know, bring back Hitler. That's not a thing. Will someone have clone and have a baby that's actually a clone of them? Maybe, but a lot of times our kids act a lot like us anyway, right? So I don't think it's going to warp. I don't think it's going to warp the fabric of society. Is what I'm saying. I think it's this quote says this is from Michael Crichton, who actually wrote uh, Jurassic Park, the book that was made into a movie. Ultimately, he says that. Cloning seems to provoke all sorts of moral and ethical quandaries. Seen more carefully, it's inherently the ring of a trick, lacking both the intellectual importance of basic scientific development and the social importance of a technological innovation. Ultimately, cloning is a masturbatory act. So his point is that this is, is just something we can do, maybe because we can do it, but it sh we shouldn't worry about it. Um, what might be more worrisome is we can use it, Jurassic Park could be real. People are talking about bringing back the dodo. If we have preserved dodo DNA, um, bringing back the woolly mammoth. These are things that could probably happen. And I don't know if everyone's gamed out all the potential problems with all of that. Right. The last thing, I'm going to stop because I want to leave time for questions. The last thing I was going to talk about is this idea of genetic diagnosis and designer babies. As I said, we can take one of the cells out of an early embryo, study its DNA, and then put back in the ones we want. So today, without a doubt, if you want to pay for IVF, you can choose the gender of your child. If you have a heritable disease and you want to make sure there's a 50-50% chan chance that your child will get it, you can use IVF and choose the embryos that did not get the disease. That all seems like, well, the gender selection one is weird. The idea, eliminating disease, most people get behind that. But then when you start thinking about, well, can we choose eye color? Can we choose this? Can we choose that? Some things, it's probably not that simple because there's not one simple gene. But it's just the idea of that, the fact that we can design our babies how we want. They became maybe an accessory to our life rather than their own individual I was going to talk a little bit more about that had I had time, but that's what makes me more worried than the idea of cloning. Because this is, we already see what parents do for their children. Parents themselves have selective mating. I'm only going to marry a guy from Harvard. They make their kids learn piano. We do all these things to fashion our babies already, our children already. This just seems like the next possible step to me. And so that's what and then if it's only affordable to some and not others, there's that stratification you know, problem. So th that's the thing that I worry about more than, than cloning. That doesn't seem like a big deal to me. Um, all of this was explored a little bit indirectly in this great movie called Gattaca, if you have time to see that, if you haven't seen it. But it's a future society where basically everyone is now genetically designed. And then there's those who were designed and those who weren't. And, and there's this murder mystery wrapped up to, into it. Gr really great movie. So um, all I want to do is end with, um, where does I want to end with this? I said a lot of things about fashioning our babies and then becoming a customizable product. I guess all I want to say is humans don't really have a good track record of proactive thinking in all this. And so I hope that um, some of what you learned today will help you when you come across new information in this realm. You can interpret it and think about it better. Maybe it generated some new questions that you might ask and look for. Um, and overall, I just, I, I just hope you learned something and hope you enjoyed the talk. So I'll stop there and I can take questions. What is, what is this? Uh, what are we exactly looking at right here? This on the image screen? here, yeah. So, can you darken the lights real quick, and I'll show that again. Um, so, this here is a little a little tube that's 
applying a little bit of suction to hold. This is a human um, embryo at probably the eight cell stage, so it's divided a couple times. So it's holding it in place with a little bit of suction, and they're coming in with another needle and sucking out one of the cells, so then they can go scan the DNA of this and determine if the rest of the embryo has the disease or not. You know, and then do we want to implant? So the idea is you take out this cell, either quickly scan its DNA or pop these things in the freezer, determine, okay, this one's clean, this one has the, the things we do or don't want, thaw it, and put that one back in the universe. So that's just showing you what it would look like under, underneath the microscope. Very interesting. Yes, there's a question over here. Yeah. Just, oh, thank you. Just wanted to know it, uh, the division of the eggs when this about this would happen. Uh, you've got like eight there or s whatever it is. Is it like about an eighth division when that would normally happen? Um, so I think I understood your question. The fertilized egg is one cell, and they'll divide to make two, right. and then those two each divide to make four, right. and then those two each divide to make eight. So it's um, a couple divisions later. Okay. It's a matter of hours, probably. Hours to a day, maybe, depending on how fast things are going at, at first. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yes. So a question in the back there. I got the name of the first book, but not the second oh, book. Oh, sure, yeah. I wasn't fast enough. Yeah. And this, I think I okay this to all be on lines so if you know how to find that. The first book's called Fear, Wonder, and Science. Um, that has a little stuff after the colon. The second one is called Pandora's Baby. Pandora's Baby's where I got a lot of the info on the history of in vitro fertilization, and it has all these interesting and scary tales about some of the types of experiments that were done. Uh, so that's a really great read on the subject if you're interested in learning more about how in vitro fertilization came to be. Gee, yeah. This is probably a real um, dumb question, but um, if uh, the double-strand DNA is present from both parents uh, when fertilization happens, how do the pieces of DNA in those chromosomes know that they're supposed to separate and repair up to make a new person rather than just going ahead with one set of uh, the DNA pairing? Yeah, um, let me see here. So, so some of this, I mean, some of this we still don't know, right? Like, how does it know when we anthropomorphize these things? It's like, it is hard to think about how, w w some extent, like, the, f the instructions are built in, right? And so there are mechanics at play that's almost on autopilot. Um, one of the things that happens is when the sperm enters the egg, there's, a infl there's very low calcium in the egg. There's a lot of calcium outside. Calcium influx comes in and activates a bunch of processes. So uh, things like that, where I think it's just a stepwise, when this happens, it causes the next things to happen. And then there's sort of just how that pattern evolved over time is another question, but we, we, can, we can describe some of the steps. Does that answer your, the question or close enough? Yeah, okay. With, with all this manipulation, one can imagine the possibility that it might change the mutation rates that occur. Is there any evidence of that? Or is there evidence that it isn't happening? So in terms of like, um, does in vitro fertilization cause any mutations? That, that sort of question? Okay. Um, there's no evidence that that's happening. The the largest probably drawback to in vitro fertilization is multiple births. So typically, um, with, in vi with either fertilization enhancing drugs or these fertilized eggs that they implant back in don't have a 100% success rate. So if you only want to do one cycle, you may put two or three in hoping at least one takes. But a lot of times, two or three will take. And naturally, there's a lot of health concerns for multiples. They're usually born premature. There's other, so not on av I'm not saying every twin is unhealthy, but on an average, twins and multiples have um, some health 
issues that singletons don't. And so that's probably the biggest um, like physical drawback to in vitro fertilization, just the increased rate of multiple births. Thank you. Thank you yes, so much, welcome. Dr. Sanquist, for giving us a better understanding of human reproduction in 2024 and the many facets of assisted reproductive technology. We look forward to seeing everyone next Wednesday, April 3rd, when Dr. J.R. Paulson will return with a bucket course about mind control. Can one person control or influence the mind of others? Come and find out. See you next week.